Thank you. And start. Okay. Again, thank you all for being here. What? What? You don't see it? That's why I asked if we're sharing the screen or not. No, not this one. Let me stop presenting. Share window PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, now, now it's working and let me check if it's recording. Recording and let's play this. You see it now still? Yeah, OK, all right. Thank you. We're still learning. Our next speaker is Brian Harris with Hort Americas. If you don't know Hort Americas, uh, look up their website. They sell all kind of products and they do a lot of online classes and they have. And they have. Hello, testing. I'm only temporary. I'm only temporary. OK. Um, yes, uh, I was saying that Brian Harris is with the Hort Americas. Uh, check out their website. They sell all kinds of products online. They have lots of online classes, lots of information, a uh, great resource for the hydroponic indoor agriculture control environment industry. Brian Bryan is the regional technical manager, technical sales representative for Hort Americas covering the eastern United States. He resides in Frisco and his wife with his wife and son. Brian has been involved in gardening and horticulture his whole life, but did make a career after he joined North America in 2020. Little late, but we will give him. Thank you. All right, hey everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Brian Harris with Hort Americas. So we are an agricultural supply company focused on controlled environment agriculture. Um, we focus on three things. LED lighting, we're the exclusive distributor for all of General Electric's horticultural product lines uh, across all of North America. We have group in Canada, uh, North uh, US and in Mexico. Um, we also do engineered substrates, Jiffy, Grodan, um, some peat based substrates we import from Europe, and then a full length range of hydroponic fertilizers and other supporting products, containers, sensors, things along those lines. Um, so, the presentation today is an overview of hydroponic strawberry production. Um, a lot of what you've seen is sort of theories around um, controlled environment agriculture, different uh, technologies, things. This is going to be a little bit more practical, hands on kind of guide to growing strawberries, really. Um, so what we're going to talk about, um, we're going to go over the different hydroponic growing systems, um, nutrients, irrigation, a lot of the kind of ins and outs of what it's going to take to be successful with this. Talk about um, selecting your plant materials, um, what are options available there, uh, what you can expect uh, as yields and things along those lines. So it should be a fairly good overview um, of strawberry production. So why hydroponic strawberries? Um, right now, the majority of the crops grown in controlled environment are either vine crops, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, and greenhouse type environments, or leafy greens. Um, that's great. But as we continue to scale controlled environment ag to feed the world, as we've seen in some of these other presentations, um, we're going to want to eat more than just salad with tomatoes on it. So we want to, you know, at least have some dessert. We'll, we'll um, maybe add a walnuts and have a strawberry walnut salad, you know. But we're getting closer to providing more and more food, or we need to be able to provide more and more variety of food through this controlled environment. And so right now, strawberries are one of the key areas of uh, research development that people are coming up with, moving from field-grown strawberries into a controlled environment. Um, water use efficiency is another big issue with this, and so. As again, why we want to move into a controlled environment 
is we can get better production, more consistent production, and you know better environmental impact from from water use. So I'll be honest, this isn't my research. This isn't I didn't do a big research project on this. Um, most of this information does come from ag from university research. Uh, Port Americas, we work with a lot of different universities, kind of helping support their their, their research. Uh, Dr. Cherry Kubota, um, when a lot of this happened, she was at Arizona State University. She's now at Ohio State. Um, great educator, but a lot of focus on strawberry production. Um, and then Carla Garcia, who is our uh, technical specialist, she also manages our Mexican division. Um, she did her master's degree in controlled environment agriculture, focused on strawberry production. So most of this is, is her presentation uh, and her research um, kind of backed information. So while I'm not presenting a research project, uh, it all is based on research. So hydroponic strawberries, there's a couple of different systems. Um, the tabletop system is by far the most popular. Um, this can actually be done in almost any environment in a, in a, in a field grown setting, even if you were, you were wanting to do it. Um, but it's just a support structure uh, to hold the substrate containers that we're going to grow our strawberries in. Um, we'll go into that just a little bit more. The other system is a hanging gutter system. Um, this is uh, more of an advanced, um, higher tech greenhouse type system where uh, everything is supported by, by cables, frees up the floor space, makes it a little easier to clean, uh, and just is a uh, different way of going about supporting these bags. So again, when we do hydroponic strawberries, um, it's typically a drain to waste system. Strawberry um, roots don't do well um, if we're recirculating water, we have pathogen issues, um, and it's just better to do an actual drain to waste for that. Um, but it involves using a drip irrigation system. So we have a gutter system to drain that water away so that it can be handled efficiently um, and used to irrigate other crops or um, just managed. But the main thing we want to do is we want to support our substrate bags. Um, it's a pretty, sim pretty simple, but again, it is a drip irrigation in an open system. Um, sorry, this is a little bit touchy here to move through this. All right. So as you see here, uh, this is what it would look like without plants in it. Um, we're using substrate troughs. These troughs are usually a one meter long trough. Um, they hold about 18 liters of substrate. Um, we're going to have one dripper per plant. Um, and so pretty straightforward. Um, it's just how we manage you know, the rest of the environment around it. Click the button. Don't use the roller. OK. Click the button. All right. All right, so again, very troughs, 18 liters. A um, couple of key, key things to consider when you're, when you're looking at a system is what type of gutters you're going to use. Um, we just want to make sure that they do fit the, fit the troughs um, efficiently so that um, we can manage that, that runoff. Um, Meteor's um, system uh, is one of the top gutter manufacturers. Uh, you can also just uh, have a, a gutter company come roll gutters on site for you uh, if you have access to that as well. Again, here's the design of the gutter. Uh, if you're not familiar with the gutter system, uh, they're designed to allow maximum flow of water with minimum light penetration and so that you don't have algae buildup, you don't have growth uh, underneath your plants and have issues there. So Beacon Camp is one of the bigger companies that we, we work with. Um, we've got some custom troughs that they've actually helped us design. Uh, they have a support on them with a it's called a truss support it's not as easily seen but if you look on this this one here and i may have it on another version um, that helps with the strawberries when the stems come out from the flowers so that those stems don't break off on the edge and it supports the fruit better uh, so we definitely recommend those and one thing that we'll talk about a little bit more is substrate volume um, see two liters per plant is what's recommended so in an 18 liter trough we can get about nine plants Again, drainage is key. Strawberries don't like to be sitting in, in wet water, so the troughs are designed um, with very efficient drainage. They have feet to hold them up above um, whatever surface they're sitting on so that they can drain. The hanging system is basically, you know, same function, same purpose. Um, it's just a different way of accomplishing it. Um, some systems will actually raise and lower 
these chains um, or the, the support structures so that you can harvest berries. You can have the whole system raised up with no gaps in between uh, your crops. You lower it down and that can be then harvested. And so that's a little bit more efficient use of space versus the, the other systems. That's not as popular yet, but things as this industry evolves, uh, you're going to see more of that. Again, just more on the hanging system. Um, you want to make sure that if you do look at a hanging system, that your structure's able to support it. And that's why I said this is typically more in a little bit more high tech type greenhouse system. Uh, if you're doing this in a standard hoop house, you may not want to try to support the load of all the, the gutters with, with that hoop house type structure. So uh, at that point, a tabletop system is going to be going to be more valuable to you. So getting started, a lot of people look at different growing systems. Um, they may not think, oh, I don't want to go as advanced as, as, as a full tabletop system. Um, maybe I want to do a homemade NFT system, or I've already got an NFT system that I'm growing leafy greens in, and I want to adapt that to strawberries. Um, the research has really shown, um, and just anecdotal experience, that strawberries do much better in a substrate-based system versus a soilless system with, with no, no substrate. Um, the NFT systems, you know, you have a large root mass of the strawberries that are constantly wet in the in these systems, and we tend to have more issues there. Um, some of the other systems, um, can't think of the name of this bucket system here, but it, you know, these aren't quite Dutch buckets. These are these are a, they're actually a styrofoam bucket that's designed for this stacking. Um, you can get production out of these systems. You can grow strawberries in NFT, and I'm not going to say that you can't do this. But on a, if you're trying to take this to a commercial scale, the efficiencies of some of these other systems just aren't there. And so just be aware of that. If you're, if you're just wanting to add some strawberries on the side of a, of a facility because you're doing it for a farmer's market or you're just wanting to grow strawberries on your own, um, you can implement some of these systems. But if you're looking at it on a commercial scale, um, we definitely highly recommend going to either a slab system or a trough system, which is our preferred, preferred method. Uh, NFT is risky because of the buffer capacity. Um, if you have your nutrient solutions off, um, you have some real issues with, with strawberries. And so um, you need to make sure that you have at least a wide channel uh, so that root mass can spread out and that you don't have um, too much just wet uh, material there. So moving on to nutrient requirements. There's two different stages in the strawberry kind of growth cycle. Uh, one is runner production. And so if you're doing your own propagation, um, as you can see here, these are, are elevated and the runners are, are trailing over the side. Um, if, you're, if you're not working with a patented variety, um, you're not supposed to do this with, with a patented variety on your own without permission, but um, you can grow your own strawberries runners and you can do expansion for, for a smaller scale operation. You can do that yourself. Uh, it's a very efficient way and allows you to have production when you need it. And again, that's something we'll talk about later. Um, but there's a lot of groups that are looking at strawberry production using runner production in an indoor controlled environment and then selling those out into the field. And so while we talk about this being controlled environment agriculture, uh, it's not always the, the, the fruit that we're selling. Um, there's going to be places where they're going to grow these runners and we'll have them on a hanging system. They're up there and those runners trail down. Uh, it's a really interesting thing to see in, in, in production because you've got, you know, just links of these runners hanging down that they're harvesting to then sell to a field grower. Um, we're doing some work with North, North Carolina State University. They're researching this right now um, and trying to optimize production in controlled environment um, so they can then sell this to the field. So we want to look at nutrients for that and then obviously fruit production, which is the, the most popular. Um, so let me go back. So anyway, um, here, let me get that off. You saw runners hanging there. This is what the fruit you know, is gonna look like. One advantage of this system is ease of harvest. So when we have the tabletop system, um, you've got those plants elevated, they're at waist height. You don't have workers that are having to bend over and, and harvest uh, in a field setting. And so it's a really nice, efficient way of, of growing strawberries. So when we're looking at runner production, we wanna make sure that we have fairly high nitrogen levels. Um, we have a good balance of the rest of our nutrients. Um, I'm not going to go into details too much on the nutrients. If you want to, you know, 
look at that. I, there's going to be a formula here you could you can copy um, and use for your own. But uh, basically, the main thing we want to look at is making sure that we have um, sufficient nitrogen for the runner production. And as we move into fruit production, we're going to lower those nitrogen levels. Um, we also want to make sure that we're balancing our pH. So um, we'll get into that in a minute, but that can be done with the different um, nutrient sources you're choosing. So here is the secret sauce, the researched um, ratios and formulas for the fertilizers that they're using for, um, for the fruiting production. Uh, again, this will be available um, after the presentation. So pH is one of the key things that we really need to look at. Um, strawberries require a fairly low pH. Uh, between 5.5 and 6. Um, if you if you let that get out of range, you have nutrient lockout, and those strawberries are not able to to utilize the different um, nutrients that are in the solutions. And so we want to be really really careful on that. Um, you know, with lettuces and things, there's kind of a range, but it's typically not that much of a problem if it gets out of range just a little bit, or it doesn't swing as much. With strawberries, we tend to see more uh, more issues with with pH. So we want to make sure that we're, we're on top of that. Um, check your drain every day. Watch the trends and what's happening with your with your pH, and make sure that you're balancing everything correctly. So what's happening? Um, normal. It's normal to have a slow increase in pH. Um, this is pretty typical across most crops. As long as you're seeing a slow increase, you can make adjustments. Uh, if you see your pH going down, you probably have issues that you really want to start looking into. And so that's just something to be aware of as you get into production. If you see a, a sudden drop in your pH, you probably have some sort of um, bacterial contamination or um, just your plants are getting older and not being as productive as they should be. Again, um, one of the great systems to use, um, talking about sort of plant empowerment, managing the environment, managing all these different aspects. Um, we use a blue lab system. Uh, that controls pH and it can constantly monitor, monitor your pH. Uh, so it's a really nice system that's, that's fairly simple. A lot of people, uh, again, just getting started aren't investing in full scale type operations. And so having something that can at least monitor that pH for them while they're mixing their own fertilizers and doing their own dosing themselves um, is great. So one thing we want to keep our EC um, fairly low for strawberries. They, they don't like a high EC level. Uh, if we get anything above 1.2 1, 1 with the EC, we want to flush that, that substrate. Um, so just running fresh pH water through uh, to be able to, to reduce the salt loads in the substrate uh, is really important. Uh, we want to typically keep that EC right around 1. So irrigation strategies, now that we've got our nutrients, um, we want to, strawberries again, don't like to have really wet feet but they don't like to dry out either. And so we want to try to maintain a very consistent, uh, uniform moisture content in the soils or the substrate. Um, typically we're gonna do about a 30 milliliter shot um, and we're gonna do that rather frequently. With some crops you can water once a day and, and really saturate the substrate and then let that dry back. Or you can you know, do crop steering like with tomatoes where they're building up an EC level throughout the day and then um, letting that dry back and we don't want to do that with strawberries. We want to try to keep everything as consistent as possible with strawberries. Um, so typically we're going to go about um, six to 12 irrigations a day, that 30 mils like we talked about. Uh, again, this is based on that plant empowerment. You know, there's certain variables that, that we've seen talked about. As, as you have more sunlight, plants are going to use more, um, more water. As your temperatures rise, plants are going to use more water. Um, if your humidity drops, you know, so we have to balance that. You have to be a good steward of your plants. Um, you can use environmental sensing systems um, or just make sure that you're, you're aware of that uh, and adjust your, your irrigation appropriately. So again, 30 milliliters per shot on our irrigation for drip irrigation, and then that's going to end up being about 200 to 400 milliliters a day, a day per plant. And so if you're trying to, you know, understand what your water usage might be. Um, this is where we land with strawberry. Uh, again, because we don't want to build up EC, we want to make sure that we have about a 30% dra drainage, 20 to 30% drainage. Um, and as you do your drip irrigation, that's going to flush those salts out and flush the, the, the substrates so that we don't build that EC above that 1.2 where we don't want to go. 
Typically, this is achieved with a dosing system. So you're going to have uh, three parts. If you're familiar with fertilization, uh, fertigation, this is nothing new. But uh, for those that haven't really looked into this yet, uh, these are dosatrons. Uh, they're a water-driven pump. So when it, the pump turns on and, and allows water to flow, or the valves open up and allow water to flow, um, they actually suck the concentrated nutrient solution up. You have a nitrogen-based system, a calcium-based um, part of the mix, and then your pH adjustment in an acid. Um, those mix the fertilizers as it flows through. Uh, it's a really nice system, keeps you from having to mix batch tanks all the time and, and keep everything uh, managed yourself. It automates that for you with just these large concentrate tanks. So what do we have to do about environment? Um, strawberries are typically a spring crop. Um, they like cooler temperatures. Um, they're photoperiod plants, so they have uh, light needs as well. So the first thing we want to do is manage our temperature. Um, part of this is why we moved to a controlled environment agriculture anyway. Um, as I said, strawberries are a spring crop. If we want to get a full production cycle from fall all the way through till early summer, um, typically it's a seven month cycle. Um, we need to manage the environment to keep that spring-like conditions all the time. So. Day temperature uh, is what affects the growth rate of the plant, the photosynthesis. The night temperature um, affects the ability of the plant to manage all of the nutrients and, and everything that's, that it's needing to do, manage the light. Um, and then also that impacts fruit quality. Uh, and then the average daily temperature is really what affects fruiting and, and the actual production of the plant. So air temperature. Um, Around 68 degrees is ideal. Um, that's why, again, we're not in Texas trying to grow these as a summertime crop in a greenhouse typically. Uh, if you were going to a full indoor vertical farming type situation, uh, that's your target to manage that, that 68 degrees. Um, as the day temperatures get higher, uh, you start seeing less production uh, of, of berries. And as the nighttime temperatures get higher, your berries actually start to become less sweet. So we want cooler night temperatures, and that's really what encourages the higher bricks in the fruit. Um, so between anywhere within the 50s is really ideal for a nighttime temperature. Um, and then as we get below 50s, we start to see a reduced production. The plants will still flower, they'll still make fruit, but we, we don't have the vigor that we want. And so keeping that daytime temperature around 68 degrees, um, and then you can go a, a little warmer during the day, as your growing cycle comes on, but we want to try to get that temperature back down at night um, to improve that fruit quality. Um, yeah, so basically as it, as it gets above 60, 65, um, you're going to see a higher acid ratio in the fruit and then that just makes the fruit less desirable. Um, 64 degrees on an average. We talked about that average temperature. There, there are different varieties. They're day neutral um, or June bearing strawberries, uh, there's ever bearing strawberries. Um, typically that was thought to be based purely on photo period, but at 64 degrees, almost all strawberries produce just fine, whether it's a short day or a long day. Um, so we're seeing that there's less impact of that. Once we start managing the, the environmental conditions beyond what nature's provided, then we start being able to manipulate these crops and manage them you know, to, to work better. And so again, Part of the reason we come to controlled environment agriculture is so that we can we can force these plants to do what we want them to do and sometimes understand why certain things are happening better uh, as well so root temperature um, is what really affects the growth of the plant what's affecting the flower production of the plant um, again we said air temperature at night affects the fruit fruit sweetness but um, the actual root temperature substrate temperature is what affects flower set and, and growth um, again, that 64 degrees is kind of where we want to land. Um, they saw a 10, by, by managing that and keeping it consistent, they found a 10% increase in yield um, just doing that. So one of the things we can do, uh, because we're typically doing these in a greenhouse, uh, in the cooler months, we can use a darker substrate container. Um, you can use black plastic to, to help cover those. As your temperatures get hotter, um, or if you know that you're going to be in an environment that is warmer, then we want to use a white substrate containers or white plastic over those containers to shade them and, and keep that room temperature cooler. 
So light is another thing that's really important with strawberries. We need to manage our light levels. Um, the daily light integral uh, is basically the full amount of light that that plant receives in any day. And then photo period is when the plant receives that light. So the DLI um, is basically, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's how much light is landing on that plant in any given day. And we add all that up and that is what we call our DLI. Um, 20 DLI or 20 um, moles per meter squared per day for the plant uh, is what's ideal for strawberries. The minimum is about 12. So if you have a really cloudy um, day, adding supplemental lighting is important. Um, we want to try to maintain that 20, 20 DLI so these plants have maximum uh, transpiration and maximum photosynthesis so we can get maximum fruit production. So here's an example of what DLI looks like throughout a year. So DLI is, is information gathered from different weather stations and universities and, and places and all consolidated into information for a given specific location. Um, as you see as the 20, 20 DLI threshold here, um, early season, winter, spring, and, and late fall is when we have um, that. As we go into summer months, we get much higher DLI and we want to avoid that's super high DLI with the strawberries. Um, so, you know, using some sort of shade system on your structure, shade paints, um, if you're trying to grow in those kind of more middle of summer time periods where you have higher light levels, you need to think about shading the crop a little bit. Um, light saturation. Strawberries are a unique plant. When it comes to the way they grow, strawberries really use majority of their light early in the day. As the day goes on, the, the ability of the plant to utilize light diminishes. Um, it's something that wasn't really understood until we started looking at these research projects where they're moving these plants into an, in an indoor environment and being able to control when they're receiving light. But we know that they, they actually utilize the light much more efficiently early in the day. So why is it important? Again, we're able to manage that with a controlled environment versus being at the mercy of nature. Um, so it's a negative feedback, and this is something that as more research is done in this, we may be able to have more efficient lighting strategies. And um, just like he was talking about with the, the plant empowerment, managing what we can do to control the plant over a period of time. If we can learn that, okay, we give this plant, you know, really high light intensity early in the day, and then we just back off and give it very minimal light the rest of the day, we're getting maximum production and saving energy on our light usage. There's no reason to give a plant full light spectrum, full light intensity all day long if it's really only using in the first four to six hours of the day. And we don't, I don't know of a lot of other crops that are that way, but strawberries definitely seem to have this and there's more research going on. Uh, this is what Carla Garcia did some of her research on is for her master's project was understanding this uh, negative feedback system for, from light. Basically, typically you've got these highlight levels in the in the summer months um, in your, your prime growing season when strawberries thrive. Makes sense that, you know, we have lower light levels uh, anyway, and it's shorter days so that they're not giving this long extended period of light when they're not being you know, using it effectively. So just keep moving on here. Um, so talked about light intensity and then photo period. So photo period is the amount of time that the plant gets light. So we have short day plants that want eight hours, 12 hours or less of light a day. And then we have long day plants that need more than 12 hours, eight hours. And those then produce better as that light levels go up um, or light length goes up. And then there's also day neutral varieties that don't seem to be impacted. Um, this has always been the traditional thinking with strawberries, that we have our short day, our long day, and then our day neutral, all based on light levels. What some of the research is now showing is that as we go from a cooler temperature that the short day plants would be, uh, typically experience into warmer temperatures that the long day plants would experience, we see a shift in productivity of these different cultivars, different varieties. And so when we come into a controlled environment, we can manipulate that and we can keep it at that 64 to 68 degree range 
that pretty much any variety will produce fruit in. And so it takes some of this um, long-standing kind of idea about how strawberries uh, work and turns it on its head just a little bit. Uh, again, there's still more research being done in that. They're, they're trying to understand which ones are really truly affected by it. Um, so the June bearing, again, a short day. Um, I guess I should have been on this slide when I was talking about that because that's <laughs> what we just covered there. But um, again, we're learning that it's it's as temperature dependent as much as it is light dependent. Um, you see the different day neutral varieties. Here's a list of a lot of the common cultivars. I'm not going to dig into cultivar selection very much in this particular um, talk. Um, I think it's best for you to do your own research on that that particular aspect of it. Um, but just know that the day neutral varieties are some of the most commonly produced. The Juneberry short, short day varieties typically have a sweeter, um, nicer tasting fruit, but they're a little bit more challenging to grow um, because you have to have a certain amount of short day to get them to start setting flowers. Once they set flowers, then they can go back to that. Any Again, it's temperature dependent for them to continue to do that. Um, but having short day berries, if you're going to be selling them, especially local, where you have uh, you want the highest quality, the sweetest berry, um, by being able to use those June bearing varieties versus the day neutral ones, you start to see uh, improved crop, uh, just quality, not necessarily productive capacity, but qu crop quality. Um, Here is again looking at that photo period and how you see that some of them have a fairly flat slope. Um, these varieties are your day neutral varieties that are not impacted by by the, the day, daily light um, photo period. Uh, something like the San Andreas is a much more truly photo periodic type plant. So it does definitely react to, to photo period a lot more. So if we've got short day varieties, um, and we need to get that flower initiation set. Um, typically, it takes about eight weeks from the plant starting to grow until it's going to produce, you know, viable flowers. Short day, we have to give them eight weeks of that short day that they need. So this can be accomplished um, multiple different ways. There's growers at times in the past when they first started doing a lot of this, they would literally take the, the plants, pick them up, and put them in a closet to to give them a, a longer dark period. Um, now with blackout curtains in our greenhouses, uh, you can you can actually control that with a blackout curtain type system. Um, we don't want to pick up a whole greenhouse full of flower or strawberries and take them and, and set them in a closet, but uh, it has been done um, when when this was you know just being studied. But now, like I said, with blackout, uh, as we look at our our long day varieties, if we want to increase that daily, as I said, strawberries do most of their their photosynthesis early in the day. And so at the end of the day, we can use something like a photo, photo period lamp that extends that day longer. These are very efficient lamps. Uh, it's just an 18 watt bulb that, that one every 10, 10 square feet in the greenhouse. Uh, you can extend the day with very low energy consumption and it's just enough light to make those plants continue to think that it's daytime uh, without actually having to provide true supplemental lighting to them. Um, one of the other things that's really big with strawberries is humidity control. Uh, they don't like dry weather. Um, tip burn on the plants reduces productivity. Um, so that's the plant's ability to, to transport calcium uh, is inhibited in drier climates when they, when they transpire too much. Um, and also you get tip burn on the, the flower calyx. So this impacts just the sellability of your, your fruit. And so we want to try to avoid this tip burn. Not only does it reduce productivity, it reduces just our crop quality as well. Um, the best way to do this is maintain a high nighttime humidity. Again, we said these plants, because of the way they do their photosynthesis, the nighttime is when they really move a lot of the nutrients around, when they sort of reset themselves to be able to grow the next day. And if our humidity is too low at night, uh, we have a lot of issues. What we want to do is we want to add supplemental humidity at night. Sometimes a fog system is used um, and that can be over the entire greenhouse. Um, they also set up misting systems underneath the, the gutters and to allow that humidity to rise up past the plants at night. Um, again, what we want to do is we want to push the plant to gutation. Gutation is when the 
moisture in the plant is actually forced out of um, the edges of the leaves. Uh, and that's typically achieved with about a 95% relative humidity at night. Again, using, you see in the picture here, an under table misting system uh, is very, very effective for this. Uh, some other groups have used fog curtains or plastic draped over the plants to force that humidity around the plant. Uh, that's a little bit more labor intensive. This is a, the, the misting underneath the plants is a really nice system to, to maintain that, that higher humidity level. Um, so here is an example of what that mutation looks like. If your plants have little droplets of water on them first thing in the morning, you've done a good job getting your, your humidity at night high enough. That plant has had the ability to move all the assimilants, move all the nutrition that it needs into those leaves. So they're just ready to start uh, really growing and taking advantage of the light first thing in the morning. Um, when we're in a controlled environment, we're trying to maximize all the different parameters. CO2, something that um, is worthwhile to look into. You know, your ambient CO2 in the air is around 400 parts per million. Um, if we can increase that to about 1,000, 1,500 parts per million, uh, we see a drastic increase in productivity of the plants as well. Uh, this is pretty typical for most crops. It's not something that's uncommon. It can be done through CO2 burners, as you see in the picture here, um, or just a direct injection of uh, concentrated CO2 uh, from a tank site system. But as we move into in indoor environments, we have to look at ways to maximize the productivity of that environment. Um, we want to improve on what's, what's done in the field, and adding CO2 is one of those things that allows us to, to, to do that. Air movement uh, is also crucial for, for these plants. Just helps with transpiration, helps um, prevent disease pressures from powdery mildews and things, um, so different fans. Uh, we don't want wind blowing on the plants, but we do want plenty of air movement. So if you do go into a greenhouse space, just be aware of that, that you're gonna need to make sure that you have plenty of ventilation. Um, again, root, root zone environment um, is one of the key things that really impacts strawberries. It, it, with strawberries, it, it comes back to those roots more than just about anything else. Um, so different substrates and their water holding capacity. Um, pH is very important. So again, we want to keep that pH at about 5.5 to 6, so um, slightly acidic, and then um, uh, EC of, of right around 1. So again, making sure we have the right root zone uh, environment can increase yield by 30%. So maximizing that production. So porosity in the root zone is one of the key things that we need to be looking at. Um, all of our different substrates that with strawberries, we want very well draining. Um, we want about 60% water holding capacity, but about 15% uh, air holding porosity. So we can give those roots plenty of oxygen and plenty of fresh air um, with, with our irrigation strategies. So the substrate we recommend, um, there's a lot of different substrates out there that can be used for strawberries, but the, what's, the research has shown the ideal mix is about 50% perlite, 25% core, and 25% peat moss. Um, there's a lot of um, controversy right now with, with perlite. Uh, it's also hard to get right now. It's pretty expensive. And so we're going to probably have to look at some other alternatives for this. Um, I don't have, for strawberries particularly, I don't have a, a really good recommendation right now. But as it stands, 50% perlite, 25% core, 20% pea moss is the best. Uh, you can also grow them in a high core chip mix. Um, the core chips are very well, you know, they, they match that porosity that we're looking for. They drain very well, uh, very nice substrate for the plants to, to, to root in. But we just want to make sure that it's, it is well draining and, and, and really aerated. Root problems with strawberries, again, is the number one, number one issue really to see. So substrate volume, we mentioned this earlier, but typically we want two liters of substrate per, per plant. Strawberries like to have a, light, a nice large root mass. And so when, with an 18 liter trough, we're gonna put about nine plants. Um, with your substrate bags, if you're looking at those, uh, we wanna make sure that we have again that two liters per plant. All right, so once we decide how we're gonna grow these, we've got our substrates, we need to pick, pick plants. There's a few different ways of acquiring strawberry plants. Um, you can use the Frigo plants, which are a, a runner that's actually been frozen and it's easily stored. Um, typically those are field grown and harvested. Uh, they take all the leaves off. It's just kind of a little 
tiny plug there that, that is um, dormant basically and just held. Um, those are usually the easiest to acquire, but aren't necessarily the best for uh, indoor production. Because we're trying to maximize the time frame that we're producing these in, um, those frigo plants, they have to actually grow. They don't have a lot of flower initials inside the crown ready to go. And so if you go to an actual plug or a runner that is, is more actively growing, they typically have more active flowers and will be producing quicker for you. And then you can do you know, a longer production cycle. Problem is, is they're not always available. Because of these are all field grown right now, um, they're typically on demand for the, for the field producers and they're harvested at certain times of the year. So as an indoor grower, it can be challenging. You have to plan your schedules. You want to look ahead to try to understand where you're going to source your plant materials from before you start. It's not like you just go buy seeds. You know, you have to plan ahead and understand where you're getting your plant materials and when those are available in your particular growing season. This is why coming into the greenhouse production or uh, with strawberries, making those runners in the greenhouse, they can be sourced more year round. It's gonna be a better system, it's still under development, but this is what we're looking at as, as the industry develops, that you'll see hopefully more availability of these, these plugs in, in a, again, nice rooted um, runners ready to go. So the bare root plants, um, they're stored at, uh, in a frozen state, like I said, and they can be stored in five to six months. So as far as a pure availability, these are the best ones to, to plan to use, um, but they're not necessarily the, the optimal for, for production. Keep going. Again, when you're doing your own runners, um, you wanna make sure that you get plants that are big enough that they can be viable as, as they get transplanted. Um, three to five true leaves and that little crown about one centimeter uh, is gonna be your ideal stage. And as those grow out, you'll have different sizes along that. You can harvest those runners though as they, as they mature and, and get your, your plants ready to go. Strawberries can be grown from seed, but it's not recommended. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it, it's really challenging, it takes, a lot of time and it's not the ideal. So uh, if you think you're gonna buy a pack of strawberry seeds and grow your own, have fun, um, but we don't recommend it for commercial production. So again, the differences in the different types of, of plant starts, the, the Frigo plants um, can have multiple crowns, but they're typically very small. Um, the runners, again, single crown, um, but those are typically a more productive plant. Even though they're single crown, they're typically a more productive plant um, in the long term because you get faster production. Again, I'm not going to dig into cultivars too much on this one. Um, here's a list of them if you want to do your research and understand what, what, which ones might be best for you. So crop management. Um, pollination is one of the bigger challenges with strawberries because we're taking them from a field environment into an indoor environment, especially when we're growing in the middle of the winter in an indoor environment. We don't, you know, we don't have natural pollinators. And so pollination can be accomplished by either adding honeybees, which are the most popular way of doing it, um, or in a smaller scale, you can actually do uh, hand pollination. There's a, a wand that vibrates the flowers, disperses the pollen, uh, and you can get fairly, fairly good um, production that way, but it's very manual, very labor intensive. Uh, honeybees are great. Um, they're the best pollination system that nature has ever created. The problem with honeybees is they're not really seasonal for winter time strawberry production. If we don't have good pollination though, this is what we end up with. Um, strawberries do have to have consistent pollination to produce a nice quality fruit. So another op option is bumblebees. Bumblebees uh, don't have the limitations that the, the honeybees have as far as seasonal. Um, bumblebees work year round. They, they can be used anytime. You can buy them in small quantities. The one thing you have to be aware of is a bumblebee is very aggressive on the flowers. And so if you have too many bumblebees in your space, um, it's not necessarily more is better. 
because if you have too many, they actually can damage the flowers by overworking those flowers. And so we want to keep about 20 bees per thousand square feet. Um, that's a good number to, to keep the bees happy, give them plenty of flowers to work with, but not overextend that. Um, you can also add supplemental pollen and some other things that you can um, you know, block the bees off so that they're not overworking those plants. But the best thing is just to manage the numbers uh, effectively. Um, again, the honeybees are challenging because the UV light is typically not available to the bees and that's what they use to navigate. Um, and then again, they're, the winter time is their dormant season. They're not typically as active, so they don't do as well. So as we're growing these plants out, um, pruning and managing the, the, the plants themselves is very important. We want to definitely make sure that we remove, once we're in a fruit production, we want to remove any runners. We don't want that plant putting energy into those runners when it needs to be putting energy into the fruit. Uh, also old leaves. Um, this drawing over, or this diagram here uh, doesn't look like much, but this is what we want to look at a strawberry stem. And if we see a stem that is green all the way to the leaf, then that leaf is still very active. It's a good healthy leaf. We want to leave that leaf on the plant. As you see a leaf that starts to get brown through about half of the stem, then that's a leaf that needs to be plucked off. So we want to remove those leaves as they get older because they're just not producing uh, for the plant anymore. Let a new leaf get more light and come on. Um, flowers, flower management is something that can really improve the quality of your crop, not necessarily the quantity, but if you want larger fruits, any of the smaller flowers can be removed and that will encourage the plant to produce larger, larger fruit. Um, and then early stages when we're just getting these plants started, we, we want to remove all the flowers um, until we have a large enough plant that can support actually growing. If we don't do that, we see a, just a precipitous decline for the whole crop cycle. Um, we, the plants don't catch up. We get a few fruit, but we don't get the same productive capacity that we could really have if we have a fully grown plant before we allow it to actually start producing. So until you have four, four full large uh, leaves, you don't want to allow any flowers to develop. So pest diseases, spider mites, one of the number one um, pests that we see in strawberry production. Um, you'll see where the, the mites are extremely small. Um, unless you really know what you're looking for or have good eyes, you're probably not going to see them typically. They're going to be on the underside of the leaves. But if you start seeing uh, little spots show up on your leaves where the, the mites have actually sucked um, the juice that's out of the plant, then um, you may have spider mite problems. Uh, you can spray if you're in a traditional system where you don't mind spraying. If you want to use biological controls, there's a lot of predatory mites that can be used um, for IPM that do a really good job of managing spider mites and some of these other, other pests. Uh, white flies are another common strawberry um, predator, or I mean, not predator, but um, pest. Um, again, not as common on strawberries as the spider mites, but, but a typical greenhouse pest that, that we need to be on the lookout for. Um, and then thrips are another really common one. The thrips actually hide down inside the flowers, uh, pretty hard to see most of the time, but you will see damage. It's similar to the spider mite damage, but it's a little bit more channelized um, where they actually kind of chew on the leaves versus just biting it and sucking out. Um, one of the biggest problems with, with the insect pests is that they tend to spread other diseases as well. And so managing that and protecting your plants from that's really crucial. So, once we have this going, how much yield are we going to get? Um, typically, you get about 1.2 to 1.5 kilograms per plant, and that's over about a seven-month cropping cycle. Um, or you can say, you know, between nine and 12 um, kilograms per cubic meter uh, of production. And again, this is over that typically a seven-month cropping cycle. Um, we say seven months. You can keep as long as you manage your environment. You can keep strawberries growing almost indefinitely. Um, and producing fruit. The problem is, is as those plants age, their productive capacity goes down. And so that's why you see most growers replenish their crops um, with basically every year, whether it's a seven month cycle or you can continue it on for, for longer. Um, but you do need to think about replacing those plants every year versus just trying to keep that same plant growing. So, you know, Basically, we just want to make sure that we understand the growing system. We want to keep it into a substrate-based system versus a 
uh, NFT or some other system that's not using a, a true substrate. Uh, we want to make sure that we have our pH around 5, 5.5 range. We want to make sure that our EC is around 1. Irrigation, 30 mil shot size, multiple irrigation cycles a day to maintain a consistent moisture content in the substrate. Um, and then we want to make sure we manage our environmental conditions. That 64, 68 degree temperature range is ideal, um, knowing that lower temperatures at night make for a sweeter fruit. So if we can, if we can manage that, given your environment, uh, we want to do that. Um, otherwise, it's, it's managing your crop. So that's all I have to say. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm encouraged and discouraged at the same time. There's lots of things to learn how to do it, but then like how many things that I don't know how to do it. Um, so, but I agree that do not do a strawberry in aquaponic if you want to have a recirculating system. I did visit, have a, a grower one time 